Okay, in today's lecture, I'm going to review some key ideas from thermodynamics. The main uh, reading reference source for this lecture is MIT OpenCourseWare, Course 16. Uh, 01 to 04, which is Unified Engineering. Specifically, the thermodynamic section of the thermodynamics and propulsion module. Basically, we're going to review the key concepts from Thermo 1 that you had in the second year plus some recent material which you've probably just done in your applied thermodynamics class. And there might be a few new ideas too. Okay, so the most fundamental thing is the first law of thermodynamics. Most often, we're going to be interested in the control volume form. Which looks like this. E -E. Total energy of the control volume time rate of change is equal to the energy flowing in minus the energy flowing out. So this represents the time rate of change of energy in the control volume. Now, this E dot in and E dot out, these can be heat transfer rates, work rates, or power, and or energy carried by mass flows across the boundaries. So, heat, work, or energy carried across boundaries. And this is basically an equation that states that energy is conserved. For a steady process, which is what we're most going to often be conserved with, concerned with here, where the focus is going to be on propulsion. D, CVDT equals zero, so nothing inside the control volume is changing with time. So then, we simply have, of course, that E dot in equals E dot out. So we can write E dot in like this. Mass flow in times enthalpy in plus heat flux in plus power in and similarly for the energy out m dot h out plus q dot out plus w dot out and just a reminder this h this is enthalpy which is just a combination of other properties. It's the internal energy U plus something we call the flow work, P times V. Another way to write this is U plus P over rho. Now, enthalpy is just a property, like pressure, temperature, density, anything else. And it's just a very convenient uh, property because it combines internal energy and the work that's done to move a mass flow across the boundaries of a control volume.
Now, if we use enthalpy, then typically the work or power w in dot and w out dot um, are generally going to be in the form of shaft work. So this is work carried by a rotating shaft crossing the boundary of the control volume. The reason for this is that the other kind of work you could have is displacement type work. Um, but for a fixed control volume, that typically doesn't come into play and is more often found when you use a control mass type approach for doing a first law analysis. And of course, Q in and Q out are the heat transfer rates in and out of the system. Now, most often we're going to be concerned with working fluids that are ideal gases. So this has an equation of state, which is just an equation that relates the properties, PV equals RT. And remember, R is the specific gas constant. which is the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of the gas. Also for an ideal gas, U, the internal energy, and H, the enthalpy, are functions of temperature only. Specifically, du is CV dt, where this is a specific heat capacity at constant volume. And the H is CPDT, where this is specific heat capacity at constant pressure. Generally, CV itself may be a function of temperature as well as CP. But when things are not quite that complicated, and CP equals constant and CV equals a constant, then we call that substance that behaves in that way or that we're modeling in that way a perfect gas. So then for a perfect gas we can write that by integrating U2 minus U1 is simply CV T2 minus T1 and similarly, H2 minus H1 is Cp, T2 minus T1. So there's a direct proportionality between changes in temperature and changes in both internal energy and enthalpy, and those constants of proportionality are the specific heats. The ratio of these It's called gamma, which is Cp over Cp, Cv. Now this is a property of the gas, and it's determined by the atomic structure of the gas. For diatomic gases, such as oxygen and nitrogen, and therefore air, gamma is 1.4. Now, we have, we've talked about gamma, R, Cp, and Cv, and these all are properties of the gases, but they're related, and only two are independent. So, two of these four are sufficient to specify the other two. So, to see how that is, we can look at the relation between these various properties of the gas. At first, we said R is Cp minus Cv. And gamma is Cp over Cv. So it's best to think of R and gamma as independent parameters that are very straightforwardly defined by the properties of the gas, and then Cp and Cv as 
depend dependent parameters that are the consequence of that. Now the second law of thermodynamics is a little bit trickier. Now this concerns another property entropy, which has symbol S. And what this does is it tells us about the direction of a process and about irreversibility. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have a container that initially at state one has a membrane dividing its into two equal halves and the gas is located on one side so that this is our control volume in red here. The other side is pure vacuum. At state two the membrane is broken and the gas occupies the entire control volume. Or, sorry, the entire container and therefore the control volume has expanded. Now, we'll contrast this with another situation. Where we start with an identically sized container. with a piston inside and initially the gas is occupying one half of the container and this is a frictionless piston so this is an idealized scenario of course so that we have pressure P1 inside and P1 minus DP slightly smaller pressure on the outside. So therefore the piston expands. And at state two, the piston is now pushed back and the gas now occupies the entire volume which is the same final volume as for the case with the broken membrane. So let's look at the similarities and differences between these two processes. So, ah, forgot one detail. This container with the membrane is thermally isolated from its surroundings. So it can exchange no, no heat transfer with the surroundings. So then both processes are isothermal. Because the membrane problem is insulated and for this piston, we're going to model an isothermal expansion. Both systems, let's say, have initial temperature T1 that's the same. And they're both at the same initial pressure P1. They also both have the same initial volume V1 and final volume V2 which is twice the initial volume. And both systems contain the same 
perfect gas. So then if we write the first law in control mass form for both systems, this is what we get. I'll do them side by side. So the change in internal energy is equal to the heat transfer minus the work, but we have no heat transfer and we have no work. So U2 minus U1 equals zero. Cv T2 minus T1 equals zero. So T2 equals T1. Now here we've said for the piston, we start with the same form. But now since the piston is pushed out by the control volume, work is done. on the piston. Since we said that we want this to be isothermal, that means U2 minus U1 equals zero, so that Q equals W. So the work done on the piston, the work leaving the system, must be exactly equal to the amount of heat transferred into the system. For the membrane, we can use the ideal gas law, and because the temperature doesn't change, we can write P2V2 equals P1V1. So therefore, P2 equals P1V1 over V2, and because the volume expands by a factor of 2, the final pressure is half of the initial pressure. For the piston, the work out can be determined by the integral of PdV. And since we're doing an isothermal expansion, heat's transferred in to keep the temperature constant. So using P equals R T1 over V, we can write that W is the integral of RT1 from V1 to V2 dV over V. So the work is R T1 on V2 over V1 and Q equals R T1 ln Q because V2 over V1 is 2. You can put that there. Okay, so now at state two, the temperature hasn't changed and the volume is doubled. So again, from the ideal gas law, we can get the P2 equals P1 over 2. So the key. The key outcome here is both processes have the same initial and final states. P2 is one half of P1. The volume has doubled. The temperature hasn't changed in both cases. So, the point is the first law of thermodynamics allows us to determine these results for both processes, but it doesn't tell us anything about the process direction. So as far as the first law is concerned, going from state 2 to state 1 is just as okay as going from state 1 to state 2. But in reality, we wouldn't necessarily expect these processes to be able to run in reverse. So specifically, gas is not going to go from one half of a container to, to go from filling a whole container to just being in one half all by itself. 
the membrane system would require some kind of external work input to return to state 1, and therefore we would also need to remove heat. Now, since there's no heat transfer for the membrane system during the process from 1 to 2, then the net effect of a round trip, so from 1 to 2 and back to 1, can be written this way. So if we go from 1 to 2, and if we think about the system and the surroundings, for the system, Q equals 0, W equals 0. For the surroundings, Q equals 0, W equals 0. But to go from 2 back to 1, The system would require heat to be removed and work to be added. For the surroundings, heat would then of course be added and work would be removed. So we've left the surroundings in a different state in order to get the system back to its initial state. Now, what if we consider the isothermal expansion using the piston? So again, if we go from 1 to 2 for the system and the surroundings, here Q is greater than 0, W is less than 0, and for the surroundings, Q is less than 0, and W is greater than 0. Going from 2 to 1, for the system, we get the opposite. Q must be negative, W must be positive. And from the surroundings, then Q is added, and work is removed. So the net effect on the surroundings for the isothermal expansion to return the system to its initial state is zero. Nothing changes. So when we have a process, we see that there's a fundamental difference between these two processes because of this change in the round trip behavior. So we call a process which when undone, or when you do another process that brings you back to the initial state, leave the mark on the surroundings. So the surroundings have had the change state in some way. This kind of process is irreversible. Conversely, if we can undo the process and no mark is left on the surroundings, then it's a reversible process. And you'll recall that the second law says that the change in entropy in total for the system and the surroundings is always greater than or equal to zero. And it's equal to zero only for a reversible process. For all irreversible processes, the net increase in entropy is positive. And so the second law, an entropy, tells us something about which direction of a process is possible. 
Now, for a perfect gas, if we write a change in entropy ds, this turns out, I won't derive it here, but CV dt, t, dt over t plus r dv over v. And what does this tell us? Well, temperature, specific volume, are properties. So this just says that entropy is a property. Despite how nebulous entropy seems because we can't easily measure it, there is no way to directly measure it, it's a property that depends only on the state of the system, just like temperature or density or pressure. Now, if we look at the change in entropy from some reference by integrating, we get this. And then, using PV equals RT, so that dv over v is dt over t minus dp over p, then s minus s naught, we can write as cp long t over t naught minus r on P over P naught. So S is a function of two other properties. And delta S, change in entropy for the system, plus the change in entropy for the surroundings, is greater than or equal to zero. Either one can, can be negative, but the sum will always be positive or for a reversible process be zero. So a reversible process where this is the equality holds here is the most efficient type of process that's possible. But in the real world, irreversibility is the name of the game and is caused by unavoidable things like friction. heat transfer across finite temperature differences and free expansions. That is, expansion of a gas where no useful work is done. And this is like the membrane problem.